on tonight's episode of Worst of the Worst. Let's take a trip to North Carolina, Winston-Salem to be exact, to visit the Errol Moses case. Between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. on 24th of November, 1995, Ronald Webb, Anthony Shepard, and Ricky Griffin were in Crockett's Barbershop in Winston-Salem. As the three men were leaving the barbershop, the defendant approached Griffin. They began arguing, and Griffin pulled out a knife on the defendant. After a brief skirmish, Griffin apologized, and they went their separate ways. On the 25th of November, 1995, around 2.30 a.m., Donna Brooks saw Griffin talking with the defendant on a street corner near Griffin's house. Griffin was a drug dealer who also stole property and sold it to make money. Griffin frequently dealt with the defendant. During this encounter, Brooks testified that Griffin was attempting to sell a cell phone to the defendant. According to Brooks, the defendant told Griffin he didn't want the phone, but he did want marijuana. Griffin told the defendant he would return to his house and page Larry Kaysen to get some. Brooks then asked the defendant to take him home, and then the two men left in the defendant's Volkswagen automobile. Soon after that, Griffin's brother, Randolph Griffin, saw Griffin in the kitchen of their residence in Winston-Salem. Griffin told his brother he was trying to page the defendant in Kaysen. Telephone records indicate that six calls were placed from the telephones at Griffin's residence during the early morning hours of the 25th of November, 1995, between 2.47 a.m. and 2.55 a.m., including two calls to the defendant's pager and four calls to Kaysen's pager. According to Randolph Griffin, when he left to go upstairs to his bedroom, his brother was still in the kitchen. Thereafter, he heard three gunshots outside his house. When he ran outside to see what was going on, he found his brother lying in a pool of blood in front of his house. Randolph then called 911, and law enforcement and emergency rescue personnel arrived within a few minutes. Griffin was transported to the hospital and pronounced dead shortly thereafter. At the crime scene, law enforcement officers found a 9mm shell casing on the ground, approximately 15 feet from the victim's body. On the 27th of November, 1995, Randolph Griffin was raking the front yard of his house when he found two additional 9mm shell casings on the ground. He called law enforcement who came and retrieved the shell casings. According to Kaysen, on the 25th of November, 1995, after receiving the second page from Griffin, he returned the call from a residence where he was playing cards. He told Griffin he did not have any marijuana to sell. Thereafter, k testified he left the card game and was driving home when he received the third page from Griffin. At that point, k pulled over and called Griffin from a telephone, but received no answer. He then decided to go see what Griffin wanted. When he arrived at Griffin's house, he saw Randolph Griffin holding his brother in the front yard. Each of the telephone calls placed to and from the Griffin resident was confirmed by telephone records. Dr. Patrick Lance, a Forsyth County medical examiner, performed an autopsy on Griffin's body on the 25th of November, 1995. Lance determined Griffin died as a result of three gunshot wounds to the head. Two wounds were about one inch apart in front of the victim's right ear and one wound was to the left side of his head. The two wounds on the right side of the face were surrounded by stripling, which is caused when gunpowder comes out of the barrel of a gun, strikes the skin surface, but does not completely burn. Because of the presence of stripling, Lance determined these two shots were fired from a range of approximately two feet or less. The third wound on the left side of the face did not have stripling. Therefore, Lance could not determine the distance from which the shots were fired. Further projectiles recovered from Griffin's body were determined to be from a medium caliber handgun, possibly a 9mm. We're going to pause right there 
and move to the Dunkley murder. Same defendant, different case. Sabrina Mims met the defendant in December 1995, and they began dating shortly thereafter. That same month, the defendant introduced Mims to Jacinto Dunkley. The defendant informed Mims that Dunkley was the person for whom the defendant sold drugs. During the time that they dated, Mims observed both a 380 caliber pistol and a 9mm Ruger handgun in the defendant's possession. Sometimes during the week prior to January 27, 1996, the defendant attempts to get Mims' cousin, Shantina Givens, to set up Dunkley by meeting him and finding out where he kept money and drugs in his house. The defendant offered to pay Givens to carry out the plan, but Givens refused. On the 26th of January, 1996, Mandy Wood, Dunkley's girlfriend, was watching television at Dunkley's house when the defendant called. Dunkley answered the telephone. Hey, what up? He and the defendant began to argue about how Dunkley had been trying to get in touch with the defendant, but the defendant had been avoiding him. At one point, Dunkley got upset and hung up the telephone. The defendant called back, and this time, Wood answered the telephone. She handed the telephone to Dunkley, and he and the defendant began arguing again. The two ended the conversation by agreeing to meet the next night on January 27th, 1996, at 9 p.m. On the 27th of January, 1996, the defendant and Casey McCree were at Mims' apartment in Winston-Salem, drinking and partying with a number of different people. According to McCree, it was an all-day event. The telephone records indicated that at approximately 9.09, the defendant received a page from Dunkley. Thereafter, between 9.30 p.m. and 10 p.m., the defendant asked McCree to ride with him to Dunkley's house. The defendant told McCree that Dunkley owed him money and that he was going to collect it. The defendant and McCree left the apartment in the defendant's Volkswagen and proceeded to Dunkley's house. The defendant told McCree he was going to go do something and if another person is there, you're going to have to go ahead and do her too. On the way to Dunkley's house, the defendant stopped at an Enterprise car rental, where there the defendant stole a black Buick automobile. McCree then drove the Volkswagen and the defendant drove the stolen Buick to an undisclosed area where they left the defendant's Volkswagen. They proceeded to Dunkley's house and when they arrived, the defendant parked the stolen Buick just across and down the street from the house. The defendant and McCray approached the house, and McCray knocked on the door. Dunkley answered the door, and McCray shook his hand and walked in. The defendant pulled out his 9mm Ruger and approached Dunkley, who backed into the kitchen. In a fierce tone, the defendant began asking Dunkley where his money was located. When Dunkley asked, what he was talking about, the defendant shot him in the chest. The defendant asked again, where the money at? And then shot Dunkley in the head. While Dunkley lay dead on the floor in the kitchen, the defendant asked McCree to help him ransack the house so it would look like a robbery. McCree saw the defendant take a wad of money from a drawer in Dunkley's house and a gold-colored diamond ring from his finger. When the defendant left Dunkley's house, he took the keys to Dunkley's Pontiac and asked McCree to drive it. McCree followed the defendant who was driving the stolen Buick, and they abandoned Dunkley's automobile. The defendant and McCree drove the stolen Buick back to the Enterprise car rental and parked it in the same place it was parked earlier. From there, the defendant and McCree stopped briefly at Robin Gardner's apartment in Winston-Salem. The defendant lived in the apartment next door with his girlfriend, Anisha. According to Gardner, she was not sure exactly what time it was when the defendant and McCree arrived at her apartment, but it was dark outside. She testified that the defendant asked her to hide a gun, later identified as the 9mm Ruger used in both murders. Around 11.30 p.m., the defendant and McCree returned to Mims' apartment. Later, the defendant, McCree, and Givens left the apartment and were involved in an automobile accident. 
when Winston-Salem Police Officer John Tesh arrived for the scene, he found the defendant, who had been driving the automobile, lying about 20 feet from the wreckage. The defendant complained that his right arm was hurt, and he tried to stuff a wad of money into his pants pocket. Tesh also observed a pager, a gold-colored diamond ring, a black leather jacket, and a torn T-shirt lying on the ground, three feet away from the defendant. Additionally, Tesh discovered McCree lying near the car and Granisha Givens' body inside the car. Granisha Givens was pronounced dead at the scene, and the defendant, McCree, was rushed to the hospital. According to Wood, Dunkley's girlfriend, Dunkley drove her to work at 6 p.m. on the 27th of January, 1996, and was supposed to pick her up when she got off work at 2 a.m. the next morning. However, Dunkley never arrived, and she did not hear from him. On the 30th of January, 1996, Wood went by Dunkley's house, but no one answered the door. On the 31st of January, 1996, Winston-Salem police officers respond to a possible break-in call. When the police arrived, they discovered Dunkley's body in the kitchen. The house was in disarray. A 9mm shell casing was seized from the scene. On the 1st of February, 1996, Lance, the same medical examiner who examined Griffin's body, performed an autopsy on Dunkley's body. According to Lance, Dunkley died as a result of two gunshot wounds. One to the left side of the head, above and behind the left ear, and the other to the abdomen and right arm. The head wound was surrounded by stripling, indicating a shot was fired from a possibly two feet or less. The wound to the abdomen was caused by a bullet which entered below the rib cage, exited above the right rib, and lodged in the right arm. The projectile recovered from Dunkley's body was also determined to have been fired from a 9mm handgun. A few days later, after the murder, the defendant was incarcerated in the Forsyth County Jail on other charges. The defendant telephoned Anisha from jail and asked her to get the 9mm Ruger from Gardner's apartment and take it to Tony Duncan. According to Duncan, he spoke with the defendant on the telephone and they agreed that Duncan could buy the handgun. Thereafter, on approximately the 1st of April, 1996, a Winston-Salem police detective seized the 9mm Ruger from Duncan in the course of his investigation of the Dunkley murder. Special Agent Thomas Trucham of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation performed a ballistics test on the 9mm Ruger compared with the evidence seized in both the Griffin and Dunkley murder cases. In the Griffin case, Trocham examined three cartridges cases, which were recovered from the crime scene and a bullet fragment which was removed from Griffin's head during the autopsy. After examining these items, he determined that each were fired by the defendant's 9mm Ruger to the exclusion of all other handguns. In the Dunkley case, Trotram examined a cartridge case recovered from the crime scene and two bullet fragments taken from Dunkley's body during the autopsy. Again, after inspecting these items, he determined that each was fired by the defendant's 9mm Ruger to the exclusion of all other handguns. The two murder charges were joined for trial, and the trial began in Forsyth County on the 3rd of November in 1997. On 14th of November 1997, the jury found the defendant guilty of one count of first-degree murder under the felony murder rule and a second count of first-degree murder under both premeditation and deliberation and the felony murder rule. Thereafter, on the 18th of November, 1997, the jury recommended death on both charges, and the trial court entered judgment accordingly. The defendant appeals to this court as of the right from the sentence of death. In conclusion, Errol Moses was sentenced to death by the state of North Carolina for the murders of Ricky Nelson Griffin and Jacinto Dunkley. According to 
court documents, Errol Moses would murder Jacinto Dunkley in 95 and would murder Ricky Griffin in 96. Both of the murders were drug-related. Errol Moses was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death.